Okay. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, I had to redo my password, but I'm here. Good. Well, we're just checking in. So you're, we're coming to you next. But Barbara's telling us about her work. And could you repeat the group again, Barbara? Yes, they're called the Intentional Endowments Network. And so this is, this is kind of the perfect marriage for me because my husband and I have both been involved in socially responsible investing, you know, using investments to, to move corporations in the right place. Um, and so coming out of the divestment movement, we've been in a conversation now for about four years with university presidents and trustees and people who do socially, socially responsible investing professionals. And we've created this whole network trying to help them move their endowment money into things that align with their mission. And certainly um, the environment is part of their mission. If the purpose of a university is to propagate, then having an earth to propagate it on seems rather relevant. <laughs> yes, yes. And Barbara, do you know about As You Sow? Yes. Great, great. Because I know they're doing some parallel work there and have done some great research on places to invest. Yep. So actually, just as we were going on this call, I got an email from my friends at the Intentional Endowments Network that we're having a community investing roundtable at the Boston Foundation with a bunch of local area colleges. And I will bet you, as you so, is in that conversation. Great. Great. Well, happy to have you on the call. And um, Sharon Joy just came on. So we're, you might see on Kiko Chat, we're telling, you know, we're reminding folks where we're from, where we live. And then just something new, a new idea, a new collaborator, a new project, advancement. Just give us a little update. Okay. Sharon Joy Clyde here in St. Petersburg, Florida. You're not transmitting well, Sharon Joy. I think it's... Oh, okay. Sorry. Try that again. Sharon Joy Clyde, St. Petersburg, Florida. Today, I heard Otto Sharmer introduce his new book, on theory you and oh. it was just delightful what what we could hear in an hour and i've signed up for his course on what's his called transforming capitalism oh boy so uh be happy to send it to you all that's very exciting what i'm noticing is the the momentum and the speed with which these theories that he writes about and we've been tinkering with for 20 some odd years are growing. So that's me. Great, thanks so much. I think, every, I think every, I've think i got everybody that's on the call. By any chance, one here that I can't see? I think that's us. Okay, so we're now gonna transition into our topic for this call, which is Jim's journey into the depths of neuroscience to find insights that can help in doing climate change work. And um, Jim and I are gonna have a bit of a conversation on this. And there's also, um, after a couple of the rounds of our conversation, there's gonna be a conversation point for all of us. So as you listen, we're not gonna be having any visuals, I don't think that accompany us on the Kiko chat board, but if you wanna jot down anything as you listen, <laughs> of what's coming to your mind that would be helpful for our conversation. So, um, Jim, just to get started, um, before you even tell your story, can you just give us a succinct definition of that you're using when you use the word neuroscience? Yeah, well, <clears throat> first of all, uh, neuroscience is blossoming and in, in, at accelerated pace, and part of that's from the uh, a decade of the brain, uh, which ended actually ended in 2000, and uh, stimulated enormous uh, amounts of research into this field. And so, neuroscience um, is is the study of basically of the nervous system that includes the the brain. Uh, uh, it includes. Uh, <clears throat> biology, it deals with anatomy, biochemistry, molecular biology, <clears throat> and so on. So we're talking about uh, what happens in the brain and uh, whether the brain is uh, supplemented by a notion of mind, uh, mind up here. So that's kind of what neuroscience is, as I understand it. Okay. 
great. And so what caught your attention to come in through this doorway um, and thinking about climate change? Tell us a little bit about your journey, where it started and-, and Okay. Where yeah, so <clears throat> <clears throat> we've been working on uh, Joanna Macy's work and uh, we developed a, uh, this idea of adding to Joanna Macy's work and supplementing it, particularly with insights from brain science. And uh, I was given that assignment. And uh, so I, I reviewed um, uh, something like uh, 50, 50 books. In fact, I bought 50 books on neuroscience. And uh, there's many more to come. I did a, um, uh, an annotated bibliography, uh, and that's available to our group here, if anyone wants one. And uh, it raised the question, are we talking about uh, what Joanna Macy says about shifting consciousness, or are we talking about changing minds? That was a question that I've had all through this. Mm. And then uh, at the same time, I reviewed some sort of more popular books, and I'll be talking about those soon. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, and if, Marty, why don't I just move yeah, into that? Uh, but why don't you... So I think we're now... Do you want to talk about some of the books that you came across that seem particularly relevant for our interest in... Mar in Marty? Yeah. Yeah. Marty? Yes. Um, Jim just said that if we're interested in the bibliography, we could get it. Is there some way we could indicate that now or just have him send it to all of us or what? I'll be pleased to do that. Uh, and um, it's 17 pages. Uh, Good. <laughs> and also I'll be pleased to uh, send my notes from today. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, which has all the references and so on, that kind of thing. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, and if anything else comes up in what Jim's saying, when we, we can bring it up and we ask questions to make sure we get everything we want. But okay. So right now, Jim, if you could just talk about some of the, maybe give us a few nuggets from some of the books that you feel are most key. Yeah. Uh, So uh, starting then with uh, some of the more popular books, uh, why are, like this, why our brains are wired uh, to ignore climate, climate change by Mr. Marshall. And uh, just a few quotes from him. Um, he says, we're so poorly evolved to deal with climate change. We deal, we'll deal with that lofty stuff some other day. So that's what he uh, has to say. And uh, the next is uh, uh, this one. What we think about when we try not to think about global warming and just some uh, thoughts there. Uh, Mr. Stokness, who's, I believe, Nor Norwegian, uh, talks about the five psychological barriers that block the climate change message. Uh, and he has them all, he calls them the five Ds. And one of them is um, distance, it's far away. One is doom. One is dissonance, uh, what's actual what we actually do versus what we should do in terms of, say, choice of cars. Uh, another D is denial, and the last D is identity, meaning uh, a resistance to a change in self-identity, uh, becoming an activist rather than whatever. And then the final one uh, I want to mention, uh, uh, your brain on climate change. Why the threat produces apathy, not action. And that was a Guardian, the Guardian uh, uh, newspaper. And his claim is human brains are not wi wired to respond easily to large, slow moving threats or events, right? And so all this makes sense. And then the final one is climate change is changing us. 
And it has to do with the psychology of all this load of uh, climate change horror and doom and uh, disappearance of the Easter Islands, that kind of thing. So it changes us. And so the, they talk, uh, the author talks about why uh, climate change can be profoundly related to both negative mental health outcomes and neurological damage. Whoa, whoa. So these uh, were intriguing, and they, but they actually didn't have much to do with brain science. In fact, there, most of these books had no picture of the brain, so that's one way you can tell they're talking about neuroscience. And so I uh, uh, dove into Dr. Daniel J. Siegel's work, and I'll tell you why and uh, his take on neuroscience, and he calls it um, interpersonal neurobiology, which means uh, he's interested in relationships, and he's interested in relationships uh, that we have with each other, which we have in a community, which we have in a political system, and which, we, which concern the planet. And I'll be talking more about it once uh, Marty triggers this next question. Okay, great. Well, I, I think I also want to pause here and see if there's any questions. Yeah. Oh, somebody joined us. So welcome. It's, it's just me. I finally figured out how to get on the video. Oh, okay, great. Hi, Barbara. Okay, well, who is, wait, we've got two phone calls, though. So. Um, oh, so you're on both the phone and the video. Okay. <laughs> Okay. okay. Nancy, you have a question? I do. Okay. Jim, on your bi bibliography, the ones you've listed so far are all explaining what in our brain works against our understanding these things. Are there any books or research that deal with the flip side of that, what allows us to understand it, work with it more constructively, etc.? Yes, we will come to that, I Thank hope. Okay. And I, I uh, excuse me, I, I will let other comments. Okay, so you want to hold that for a minute? Um, sure. That allows us to understand time. Are there any other comments? Did anything really jump out that you want to, anybody wants to underscore? Right, kind of give me a little heads up, hand up or Linda just chime in. Yeah, Sharon Joy. Yes, I, I'm struck by and I will stay attuned till the next uh, station comes in because of my area of interest in shifting consciousness or changing minds. Mm -hmm. So I look forward as you get to that, Jim. That's oh, good. my flags. Good. That really struck me as well. I'd like to explore more about that. Any, any, anything else that struck you in, in what Jim's laying out so far? Anyone else? Same no? reaction. It's far. Exact same thing was resonating. I wrote it down. Yeah. Good. Good. I mean, this is Linda, I thought the identity thing was interesting. You know, there's resistance for people to kind of step into the activist, um, you know, uh, bogey because, well, they've just never done it before. They, they, they might totally believe in climate change, but what does it really mean to be an activist? So that might scare them away. So maybe there's small steps that, you know, we can help them with. Great. So we've got a couple areas here. Anything else we want to get out on the table? And then maybe Jim can lead us in some more thinking about some of these, these topics. We've got three of them so far. Anything else coming up right now? I think these are pretty juicy. Yeah, Jim, I don't know where you want to begin with this, whether you want to start about digging a little deeper around the thinking around. Yes, I, I would like to changing minds would that be a place to start no let, let's uh, let's start with the uh, pursuit of Daniel Siegel and see if we can make sense of his his ideas and frameworks and is he going to lead us into these areas we've just kind of brought up yeah yeah he sure certainly will and just in in regards to small steps uh, in our uh, congregation, uh, we sent a group up to uh, Albany, New York to uh, protest um, oil trains uh, bringing oil 
um, from from the fracking uh, land uh, to um, through Albany and uh, leaving the trains on the track right uh, next to uh, impoverished neighborhoods and how that affected the people who went there. And that was sort of the small steps and some of them became quite active after that, some of our folks who went there and protested that situation. So um, let me um, talk some more about uh, Daniel Siegel. How many know Daniel Siegel's work? Uh, I read it a while back. But yeah. yeah. So uh, you know that, first of all, it's, it's very accessible, uh, meaning you don't have to pay $30 for an article uh, in the uh, academic world. Uh, virtually everything he has, he puts up on YouTube or in his uh, 12 or 16, 16 books, uh, his latest being The Yes Brain. Uh, he um, is a child a psychiatrist, psychotherapist, and so he has a developmental uh slant to his work. He's very interested in how relationships um, uh, help us all develop and develop our brains. And um, he has a, a fabulous uh, organization called Mind Sight Institute and that offers courses. Uh, and one of the courses is uh, you read you the group uh, each group member who comes uh, reads one of his books and uh, then they meet with Dan and talk about they have uh, uh, extraordinarily uh, vigorous conversation over three days about the various books and the interpretations and uses. So that's another reason I chose him. He's also organized uh, Mind Gains organization, which is a collection of all the neuroscience people uh, who are interested and in, includes uh, high school teachers as well as therapists. And, and, uh, so uh, <clears throat> that was sort of why I, I chose him, that he was accessible, that he, yeah. uh, he has a theory and he, he has a uh, proposal. And that's what we're going to talk about a little here. And uh, one of his questions is, what is the connection among the mind, the brain, and our relationships with one another and with this planet? So that's the climate connection, which we all share. So maybe I'll stop there and see if there's any thoughts or comments. Well, I think what we're a little hungry for is for you to be begin to give us a little more content around some of these provocative ideas that you've laid out. So okay. you could maybe tell us a little bit more about where, what his proposal is, no. these connections and how, how you see it tying into, maybe even tying into the example you gave us of the people that went to the trains and how that, something happened to them when they went to the trains, which maybe illustrates some of his points. Yes, yeah, so uh, first of all, um, the idea of the mind is central to his work. And uh, as he says in several books, uh, about 10, 15 years ago, he met with a lot of folks, a lot of people interested in neuroscience. And through a process, uh, developed a definition of the mind. And he argues that a lot of people who use the word mind can't define it. So one thing I did was check out, say, Howard Gardner's work on multiple intelligence and, and changing minds. And he never defines what a mind is. And that, I don't know whether others have found that true. So how does, how does Siegel define mind? It sounds like he's working from a very concrete sense of what he's talking about. Yeah, so 
he got them to, uh, he, the group then agreed on a definition of mind. And first of all, it said that it includes at least three fundamental aspects, personal subjective experience, a consciousness, and a regulatory function, that it's emergent self-organizing process, an extended nervous system, and its relationships. So in this way, a core aspect of mind is defined as embodied and relational process that regulates the flow of information and uh, energy. So, in, I would like everyone to think of a triangle, triangle, and uh, I, I want you to put a brain on one, on the apex, say, and then uh, mind, and then relationship, right? Brain, mind, relationships. Crash, crash, and uh, <clears throat> that then, uh, and then once you have the the uh, points labeled, incidentally, I love triangles. Once you have the points <laughs> labeled, uh, draw double arrows on each side, and that is represents the flow of energy and information and it's regulated by the mind. It is enriched by relationships. And uh, the brain then is kind of, like, um, kind of like a computer. And the mind is kind of like a program, a program for the computer. And as we know, computer uh, and uh, program uh, are devoid of relationships, right? Pretty much. Uh, Jim, to clarify, and apologies, because yes. I know you said this and I missed it. it. What, what were the two what? apexes besides uh, brain? Brain, mind, and relationships. Okay. And so you can just take that. And for instance, you can apply it to our, our network here. Uh, we have, uh, <clears throat> what to what extent do we have a brain, a brain being... A, uh, a a nervous system, a, including the nervous system, and uh, what's the mind of this network? How do we regulate what goes on, the flow of information and energy, and uh, what? How are we in relationship? So let's let's think about that a bit, please. Well, maybe we can pause and take some questions or insights from yeah. what you said, thinking about our work, because these could be seen as three intervention points or variables that affect our work. Do you have any comment or insight on that? I, I still want to go back to your example of the people that were transformed somehow when they went out to the trains. Yeah. Um, try to get this model to help us know why. I mean, common sense kind of tells us why that happened, but, but if we're trying to really have a deeper understanding from a point of neuroscience, what, what happened to those people? I don't know. I will open it up to the other group, others in the group. What would people speculate happened? I'm not sure well, about the example of when I talk about feels, uh -huh. When you have a common passion, your energy is high, your vibration is high, you start to cohere. Uh, it, it, they say magic happens. I think it's uh, something that could be eventually traced out in science. But I, I, I know what you're talking about. I can feel it myself when you said it, Jim. Okay. You know, one thing that I think happened is I think, like getting back to Linda's point on this identity piece, I think people had a shift in how they saw themselves. I see, yeah, great. They had a shift in how they saw themselves doing this thing, going out. The first time somebody takes an action like that, it can feel really uncomfortable. And then suddenly they realize the role they're playing. And especially you mentioned that there's a low-income community right there. The people yep. that, there, that there's people that were 
right at risk for what these trains were transporting. So it becomes a very human experience. So I see somehow identity shifted there in a very mm -hmm. positive way, probably tying into Sharon Joy's field idea, the field, yeah. uh, this new way to experience the, their field of action. Other thoughts? Yeah, Nancy. Well, the thing that, they, that neuroscientists keep bringing up about the difficulty of the human brain in dealing with these big issues that are far removed and suddenly it's right there in your own backyard physically present and the danger is immediately evident to your family and your home and that triggers all the construct i mean the uh alarm responses that stimulate action right it's not distant anymore and all those things yeah I, I have a good example of that. This is Linda. Um, back in Tubac, where my main home is, oh my gosh, this is a little tiny artist village, and the town is absolutely up in arms now about a 16 pump uh, diesel tra uh, truck stop coming in right in front of our town on the highway. And so I've never seen the level of action uh, around that. Um, not that we can do much about it because it's owned on private land, but you know, uh, I think there's something about the um, focus around, you know, if, if I see everyone around me doing it, then I'm going to, it's not going to be so hard for me to take action. Yes. Yeah. And Rick, Rick. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking, I mean, in a way, what Jim's example brought up is, is the whole personalization and immediacy. Um, right. When you um, see people who, to whom things like immigration reform has been a distant, issue that they concerned about when they go to the the to vote perhaps but it's not immediate and all of a sudden maybe their town or their local congregation decides to be a sanctuary and they start meeting the people and they start putting themselves sort of on the line or it's your friend that got arrested you know, i never thought about getting arrested for a pipeline protest but I think about it now because I've had several friends who've been arrested. It gets, that's relationship. That gets much closer. Yeah. Great. What else? So, so can we try to loop this back in now to this idea of the question you were holding, Jim, about is it about shifting consciousness or changing minds? Do you, did yes. you sit down on one side of that in your own insights or what is Dan Siegel saying about that? Well, the way Siegel views it is that uh, consciousness is part of mind and uh, as well as um, uh, uh, the uh, other aspects and uh, the idea, I did start by Googling how to shift consciousness, right? <laughs> and I got 40,000 <laughs> entries or something <laughs> like that. And I said, oh my God. I, and uh, so changing mind is a lot better or a lot more practical than shifting consciousness, particularly if you use Siegel's schema, it says, okay, uh, you change your mind and your consciousness changes also. So I don't know where that makes yeah, sense. I'm having trouble understanding the significance of the difference of thinking of of those two things can somebody help me or or so, so jim jim yeah. you gave three terms and i'm sitting here well have you actually you've actually introduced another one you've used consciousness mind and brain and, and then relationships i understand relationships and i may have missed it i probably did but yes. i'm not quite sure how you're defining where consciousness fits in that, and what the difference is here between brain and mind. Is brain the physical in mind? I don't even want to say. I yeah. Want to say. So maybe uh, it'd be better to say the um, embodied brain. And uh, to Siegel, that means the, all the, the central nervous system, the brain, and the body, and its sensory uh, capabilities. So that is sort of what's there, but uh, it needs some way of regulating the flow of information and uh, 
energy uh, to it and uh, before it can sort of make new, new pathways, neuroplasticity kind of pathways. And um, uh, so the, if, if you have this separation between the brain and the mind, uh, you can then say, okay, I can work on the mind to change the brain and develop, uh, and I can work on the mind through relationships, which is what we do when we try and communicate uh, climate change kind of uh, concerns. So mind is consciousness? Mind is consciousness, but it's also several other things. And uh, uh, it's, um, it, it, it's a... Uh, it's a subjective experience, so that's where the emotions uh, come in. And so we were talking about, uh, you know, emotional, the emotional content of what we're up to, like feeling uh, uh, the despair of a community under attack in, in the railroad example. Uh, yeah. Okay. This is Linda. Um I remember going through Dan Siegel's work and um, I remember that one of the most important things about this model um, is its aspect of uh, uh, upbringing, child, child, uh, children, up, ch child upbringing. Right. The importance that the relationship played between the caregiver and the, the children. I mean, we model and so modeling and you probably all heard of this, this notion of mirroring, you know, where the child sees the parent and they really see themselves. So if the parent is trying to lay down brain tracks, you know, into the child's, you know, brain, first of all, the child at that age is very sensitive to what is being mirrored back to them. So, you know, that's why in many cases, I've found myself lately saying, well, we just need to have a lot of older people die off, you know, that younger people are becoming, you know, more and more ready to accept the, um, the horror of what's coming and ready, better able to make changes in their, their brains and in their minds because they've, they've accepted it. They've already got brain tracks. You know, brain, the brain part is what we do habitually. And those are laid down very early in life. So, you know, young child upbringing really does play a huge role in going to change society. Beautiful. Marty, you've got a question. Oh, yes, yes. Do you have a question? I'm sorry, I was taking notes. Sharon Joy, yeah. Yes, yes. well, from my fascination with these topics of brain-mind relationship and Dan Siegel's and others' perspectives, my conclusion and uh, confirmation, as we sometimes get into these biases, is that mind is not in the brain, that mind is part of, 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 of awareness. We have mind in our gut, we have mind in our cells. There's lots of evidence that mind, that word, again, I think you asked that, Rick, about uh, the uh, synonym, perhaps, of consciousness. But the uh, evidence shows that mind is actually throughout our bodies. It's the brain, I like what you said, if you want to take it to modern uh, examples of thinking it is the computer or like the TV set or the radio that gets the signals. But uh, I'm fascinated that mind exists. I believe people who do, do body work discover that uh, mind will show up when different parts of the body are touched or something and memory, etc. So I wanted to add that piece. Oh, also speaking of early, Linda, I've found myself just deep into the wells of early childhood experiences. And maybe some of you have heard this acronym ACE, Adverse Childhood Experiences. Yes, yes, I have. That's a really important body of work. It's coming in so strongly, you know, how I like to notice the energies that may not be my plan, but what keeps showing up, it's, it's cascading all around me. And uh, tragically, uh, people have determined that these early childhood experiences are, have influenced most of humanity. They name 10, and most of us, I guess in the country, the normal number is people have had seven of the 10. So think about what that 
programs you in your mind, your cells for future responses in relationships. So I'm done. Beautiful. Yeah, so we've got Rick and then Nancy. I think Nancy was first. Okay, Nancy. Yes. And then would you, could you give us a link or reference for that in the chat, please? Sharon Joy, can you a link on the on the ACE? You can probably Google ACE. Oh, I, I, yeah, I don't have it myself. I have the hard copies, but okay. uh, I would say Google it. it yeah, <laughs> if, if you Google I, adverse uh, childhood uh, experiences, then you'll get it. It's a huge body of work. Very and um, and you can actually take the test on there too. Thank you. I didn't have any early childhood experiences. I I <laughs> failed the test. No. Um, my, my question is, so when you think of this, and Jim, what you've been sharing, um, when you, do we understand why do those who are young, why are the teenagers, the high school students, and so forth, and the college students more willing to embrace climate change than our generation? Granted that once upon a time, our generation was the their generation pushing on society on other issues on other fronts and even created, uh, you know, you know, the, the, the first climate movement, but still, why is it them? What makes them ready to take that on and push it more than why aren't they burying their heads mm -hmm. in the sand? Well, Linda brought up one thing, these brain tracks that are laid down early in their brains that this is happening, but, Anybody have any other thoughts on, on that, on that question? Why youth being the ones? From, from what I've been studying, it is uh, baked into our, um, to our thinking by our beliefs. I've started and I will go back to the chat and add Bruce Lipton's biology of belief. I will also mm -hmm. include the link, wonderful video on climate change based on uh, the caterpillar that you've heard me talk about, the imaginal cells. So I find my own experience. I was just having one yesterday with an education graduate from MIT Whoa. who was arguing with me about how climate change is a hoax. And <laughs> this man is 86. So I'm he's, 86. he's an education graduate, but he's 86 now. He's 86 now. He was once a graduate. <laughs> he was once a graduate, yes. But my point is, we start these uh, programming. I think climate change has brought to the fore, as has Donald Trump, the most extraordinary research on human behaviors based on our beliefs, our cultural programming. And you know, I think, one place we want to ponder all of this is the roles that we are playing to try to engage more people to feel comfortable living with this knowledge, waking up to it, and then acting in whatever arena they want to act. And in, in my particular field of facilitation, the participation methods, we, we have a, a tool we call image shift which is very closely allied to Chris Argyris's mental models, the view that each of us carries around in our mind a construct of the world based on our beliefs and our experiences. And, and therefore, any message that comes to us, if it's not a confirmatory message to our internal mental models, it's harder for that message to get through to us because we're, we're more receptive to the things that confirm what we already have experienced or believed. So the concept in facilitation of image shift, which we do with organizations and groups, is to make more conscious um, the, the thinking about what has to shift. So what are we shifting from and what are we shifting to? So if it's an organization, you know, it can, be, it can be applied on many levels, but in my work as an organizer, in recruiting people to, let's say, my Citizens Climate Lobby chapter, I'm very aware that I'm trying to get them to share 
um, because most of the people have never been an activist in their life. They don't like that. They don't even see that an advocate or an activist, that's not, they've been a volunteer, but to suddenly see themselves, this, this will take an image shift in their minds to now see themselves in this new role. So trying to be really conscious and supportive of them embracing that shift and, and how they see themselves is part of what I see in my work. And I think I saw Barbara and then Nancy. Yeah, I wanted to talk just a little bit. I've been thinking about um, why younger people are, are so clear about this. I have a 28-year-old son who's very much an activist, and his work is on um, worker co-ops. He worked nationally, and now he's working in New York City on just that issue, on what we would call economic justice. Mm -hmm. He's also been a very strong climate activist. He's been to two... Um, UN climate summits, international ones as a delegate, as a youth delegate. So they're both very much in his DNA. And for him, these are not separate tracks. It is crystal clear that this is about a just and a sustainable society, and one is impossible with the other. So not only are there tracks there, but the tracks connect in his generation. And he's very typical of many of his friends when they talk about this. Mm -hmm. um, I think our generation has certain things in buckets, and I think they are just thinking more systemically about this. So was there another comment on that? Did Nancy, did you have a? I was just commending what you said, Marty, not, I was waving my hand. And similarly, Barbara, I would love to get contact with your son on that issue really soon. Okay. About, you mean about cooperatives? Yes. Uh -huh. Well, and this is Linda. I, I think it ties back into one of Jim's first comments about um, distance. You know, we in our generation will probably end up dying before the worst happens. You know what I'm saying? So I think, you know, kind of like Easter Island, there was a lot in the New York Times this, this Sunday about Easter Island, and it just, oh, so sad. I mean, you know, I'm sure people back in Easter Island thought, well, what were they thinking when they cut down that last tree? <laughs> you know, what were they thinking? And I think, you know, probably whoever cut it down was probably old and they weren't really thinking. But young people, they're, you know, they're more aware because they know they're going to be living longer. They know they're going to be inheriting, you know, a, a planet that's not going to not going to have the resources that they need that are required to live. So a lot of it, I think, really does have to do with age, unfortunately. Although, um, we are the elders and so if we could get it you know we could make a difference because there's you know there's a, a i mean we have more power in certain ways so that's why i'm very happy that uh rick and grady for the work you're doing i'm done yeah and Nancy, did you is that a, a hand raised or a, a hand word? raised <laughs> yeah um am i unmuted yes we can hear you okay. Two things, I'm reminded of when with CCL we were meeting with the assistant to our congressman here and we invited, we had just shared our experiences and concerns with climate and then we invited him to share his. He was a young man and he suddenly just opened up. He almost cried and he said, my wife and I aren't even certain whether we dare have children. Wow. I've heard this before. Yeah. And the other thing that was coming up for me just now, maybe I'll say just another sentence or two. The pitch I'm taking in this next show about change the politics, stop fighting each other and solve our real problems. I'm saying there's a question of how we talk with each other, which is primarily the focus of D&D. &D. There's who we talk with, which is the bridge crossing and harvesting diversity, but there's also what we talk about. And the point is to change the subject that the issues have been defined for us by the media and political campaigns that are chosen for their divisiveness and that if instead we begin with what are our real needs and begin with the solutions rather than the problem or the policy and that's why i asked about worker co-ops because i want to say we can make our own jobs here at home and look at worker-owned co-ops and the 
Cleveland Evergreen co-ops and so forth, and then work, because if we start where the ordinary person has the most immediate concerns for their future jobs, where will their kids get jobs, and then work backwards, back from that into these other larger concerns where there's a natural progression, but starting, as the old expression goes, starting where people are at with constructive, hopeful actions for the future. That's all. Right. You know, I want, um, Jim, did you want to, I want to, I want to draw us back to the neuroscience. Right. Yeah. Jim wants to say something, but I'd also like to draw us back to the, the yeah. question that we started out with, which is, you know, what allows us to understand things we can do to help people face climate change rather than trying to understand all the ways we're wired not to accept it. So I think, <laughs> you know, we're having that conversation of what this triangle of brain, mind, and relationship, that has some insights for that. But Jim, do you have any additional comments on Dan Siegel's work or other content you want to share with us around? Yes, I, I do. Uh, I would like to uh, <clears throat> reinforce what Nancy has said. In uh, Exeter, New Hampshire, we're trying to <clears throat> create um, what the MIT people call a fab lab, which is a digital, digital uh, shop where you design your your item, uh, your invention, and uh, then uh, make it. Can you explain a little more? Is it an idea you're you're you can cut out tools and assembly tool? Is it an yeah? I I it, it's called Fab Digital Fab Labs, and the idea is local. Uh, developing skills, helping people start a business. And uh, MIT has a fabulous uh, program uh, promoting this, and uh, it was described in the book called uh, 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 I can't see it right now, but <laughs> it's uh, a fabulous development. It's, uh, they even have one in Egypt. <laughs> in Cairo, and uh, during their big riots, they were, the Fab Lab was uh, uh, very busy making things. I hope they weren't guns, but they were very occupied, uh, the constructive people. But anyhow, that's, that's just my uh, reinforcement to Nancy's comment. And I would like to say a few more words about uh, uh, Siegel sorry. and- I'm sorry, one more sec. It's still yeah. showing on my screen. Oh, never mind. I just saw it, that we were recording. Never mind. Never mind. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so uh, Jim, you want to go back and say a few more? Yeah, I'll say a few more. Okay. So, uh, as, as you will find out, uh, I don't. I didn't find my answer in Siegel's work. Uh, which is too bad, but he does talk about integration and he has eight kinds of integrations and then a ninth one called um, transfer, transpirational uh, integration and that's defined as a phase where you uh, look for a healthy planet. So that's one another connection there. Uh, from his, what he had to say. Now, let me go to... Uh, Jim, wait a minute. Are these developmental phases of consciousness? Is that what these... No, no, they are kinds of, kinds of integrations. In the and consciousness? Integration? So he, he, he would argue that mental health is, uh, is an integrated self. And he has different kinds of... Uh, different labels for integrations and after a while you you get to this higher level where you you see yourself as part of the web of life so it is a spiral of the development yeah i think spiral is a good way of, of putting it yeah my my recollection this is linda that is that he is a developmentalist first and foremost and so his stages of integration 
would obviously end at when people start to see that they're actually part of this larger ecosystem. And that's what we're all kind of working on. It's also in line with um, that, oh, what is it? Um, the uh, uh, spiral dynamics, you know, Ken Wilber's work, you know, that we're all both culturally, yeah. and culturally you know, all trying to seek higher and higher levels of consciousness, which means we're integrating, you know, beyond just self and other to the greater ecological environment. Right. And so another uh, point that uh, Siegel makes is his connection with <clears throat> the mindfulness movement. And uh, he's a, a resource to uh, uh, the yoga community and uh, seeing that uh, the uh, structure and, uh, of the brain changes with both mindfulness and his view of uh, psychotherapy. So that's just another point right. for those who, and, and the book called Buddha's Brain is, uh, by Hansen has, um, has uh, that story. So I'd like to move off uh, uh, Siegel for a while, maybe you come back, unless there's some questions. Well, I, let's see if there's any questions. I mean, I, I, the, I mean, I don't think we want to know about the eight developmental stages of integration just because he believes in them. I mean, is there anything there for us around, would we, do we think that is use, a useful concept for us in doing climate change education and organizing and deliberation what do we what do we does that concept have any relevance is it worth us exploring um i leave that up to the group yeah i'm asking the group okay <laughs> asking all of you hey is it is it just thing or is there something well, i mean i this is linda again i mean just from what i know about basic psychology it's very hard to jump stages you know so that's why for instance you know, um, it's always politically unacceptable to say that people who tend to be more into ecology are perhaps more integrated or more, you know, higher, they're, they're, they're more, um, whatever, they're more developed, highly developed, or they've developed more. But in a sense, it's true. You know, so in talking with people who have not progressed in that way, it can feel like you're just talking to a wall, you know, which is why some of us have so many difficulties in trying to bring people, you know, to where we are and to, to want to do climate change because to them, the world is not that way. They don't, they see themselves as separate from nature and they can't imagine, you know, how they could be part of nature. So, you know, um, I think in our work, then we have to sort of lead them through these various stages and that, so that would be an interesting, you know, um, way of looking at what we do and, and how we provide structures that help people kind of step by step move up the, the, the little spiral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nancy? Nancy, you're muted. Um, I think you can get to a lot of the same places. My preference in framing this is to speak rather, I talk about harvesting difference and having a 360 degree perspective because we're drawing on the diverse life experiences and circumstances. And you can get at some of those issues if you have to reach people where they're at, et cetera, but treat it as if they're all on a par with each other. They're just different. So it's, it's a different image instead of a, a moving up a ladder in a developmental sequence. So somebody's above somebody else. You can think of it rather more like the, uh, the mandala or the the different positions on the compass that I, I'm more Americans use, yeah. which I, I, I'm not right at the moment disputing the, some of the developmental work that's been done, but a lot of that is a problematic framing. And I think we can get at most of how do you have to shift how you speak when you're speaking to different people just by thinking in terms, in those, those terms that I just named. Right. And benefit from, as I said, and treat them as if all have a contribution to make in their insights. Right. I mean, I'm thinking of some of the climate talks I've given where the opening 
question before you really start anything is asking people to, if it's a small group, they can just call it out or do pair shares. You know, when you think of nature, what do you love? Yes, yes, yes. When you're outdoors or when you think of going outside or doing something in the out of doors, what is it that you really love? And just things like that, that hopefully can connect people regardless of their level of sophistication around how the environment works, but you're starting to encourage everyone to, to make some of those connections. Um, we got, did Grady, is your hand up? And then Rick? Yes. Uh, uh, well, I'm a fan of uh, constructive adult developmental psychology. So it's, it's uh, I, I was unaware that uh, Daniel Siegel work uh, encompassed that or that he embraces uh, as his own developmental scheme. I, I, um, there's a, uh, I found that work uh, very useful in, in my own co coaching practice. I found it useful in my own personal development uh, to have a kind of a map of, uh, of evolving consciousness. It, uh, and I've, I've worked with a lot of other people who use those tools and there's enormous attention within the community about whether to position uh, progress through those stages as, uh, as higher or not. Um, they, they, they certainly are later in the sense that you can't get, as, as Linda said earlier, you can't get to some without going through others. But um, I think, well, you know, I, I, I suspect everyone on this call is uncomfortable with uh, the notion of a hierarchy in which some people are, you know, effectively better than, in some capacity, better than others. Uh, and yet there is that uh, that evidence that people uh, involve, can have the potential to involve, uh, and relatively few of them get to the later stages. The, uh, the, the, the further they get, I think the more likely they are to to be receptive to uh, uh, climate change kind of concern because of their experience of interconnectedness. But I think that there are ways in which people at any stage could have experiences with nature um, that uh, that could lead them to be uh, concerned and to be activists. Um, the, uh, I think the one practical implication for me of those developmental frameworks is that uh, we do need to be able to speak in terms that people at any stage would understand. And so, right. so that kind of, and there's a tendency to use the language of our own stage, whatever it is, uh, because that's the world that we see. And so being humble about uh, how to communicate with others and, uh, and, and think about uh, language and metaphors that will com communicate more broadly, uh, I think is very important. And the, and the work that Rick sent out on the, on the Framework Institute, although it's not linked to developmental psychology, I think is quite uh, astute at uh, helping come up with metaphors that do serve that purpose. Yeah, that was that was basically the point I was going to make. Is that I don't I, I think it helps us to be aware of things like uh, developmental stages because it might help us be more, better listeners. But I'm not sure it helps us frame what we say because I think we need to come up with a more all-encompassing, more open, more a connective way of framing what we say. So, because we don't know where somebody's at. And so we have to come up with the best available way to talk about climate change, given the little we might know about our audience. And so, anyways, that's where I'm at. And I, I have to apologize, but I'm, I'm out of time. I've got, you know, it's quarter of seven here and I've got other commitments tonight. So I've got to step away. It's a great conversation. Okay. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate what you're Thank doing. You. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Barbara, will you getting ready to say something? It looked like you were. Yeah, I, I, what I'm thinking about about this is if we're talking about having to bring people either around to or to a certain level of development before they're going to be able to work on what are immediate issues, um, we don't have the time. And I, and then what's hitting with me is last November, I was at the socially responsible investing conference. It's where all the finance people who do SRI come together. There was 900 people in the room. And one of the panels was, um, 
a former climate denier who worked for the oil companies and a woman who had organized the Tea Party, both of which have come over and are now working very actively on uh, installation of legislation and actually getting people, particularly in the South, to do alternative energy. And what she said to us was, it is really important that you understand their world view and that for these folks, freedom, independence, and national security were the buzzwords that hit them at the right place emotionally. And so when she talked to them about how if you put in solar energy, you are independent of the grid, and how by locally generating energy, we are more secure as a nation because you can't hit the whole grid, local groups are generating the power. That's what was selling it, and she was actually making faster progress using those arguments in the South than people were trying to get similar legislation in what we would have seen as more liberal or evolved states. So there's, there's stuff available on getting the right language. I think worldview is as important as developmental level. Great. So, excuse me. And, uh, Grady. Yeah, I, I just Brady? wanted to, to uh, Brady? Uh, yes, I wanted to agree with Barbara that we don't have time. Uh, developmental uh, prog uh, progression is uh, slow and difficult, and we don't have time. I think it makes sense to look for language for metaphors that will broadly appeal. And I want to, I, I like the one about uh, getting independent of the grid, uh, for sec sec uh, increasing security. That's, there's a body of work that, that shows that liberals tend to uh, value things like uh, fairness, justice, uh, but conservatives often value things like uh, authority, um, purity, uh, security. Um, security. One, other, one other example from the uh, Frameworks Institute that Rick was talking about was uh, they talk about uh, how to talk about uh, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, and the, 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 the dilemma being that it's, uh, it's uh, something that's beneficial in, in some ways, and so how, how is it suddenly evil? And so they distinguish between regular carbon emissions and rampant carbon emissions. And that just kind of simple language uh, makes the, the concept more accessible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anybody else have a comment on this point? Yeah, so um, is it uh, <coughs> Suzanne Morris? Is that her name who is the climate communication person? Is that right? Do I have that right? No, I don't. Oh, no. no one. I don't. She, she uh, uh, is really the, uh, she's the um, font of all wisdom in climate communication. And I'm sorry, I don't have his, her material right here, but I can look for it. Um, and, and post it. I, I, I think she's local. To, I think she's local to Santa Cruz, and she yes. um, has she written is. A book on this on the subject. And she is uh, one of the founders of the International Association of Adaptive. Uh, Perf it's uh, what's okay. When you need to do something in a hurry, is it ISAP? What's the word? I'm, what's the acronym I'm trying to think? You have to do something in a hurry. ASAP. ASAP. Thank you. That's, that's the acronym for the American Society of Adaptive Professionals, and she's one of the founders of that. Thank you. So, okay. So adaptation, not mitigation. No. It's adaptation. Is that they're true? In a contrast about, to mitig no. They're in contrast to mitigation. I mean, yeah. in addition, so we're they're focusing on issues of adaptation. Yeah. So, Marty. So, Jim. Um, uh, so, I'd like to um, move into the uh, broader broader sense of your eyes, if, if I may. I mean, yeah, we've, uh, we've got, we've got, um, when you look at more, uh, neuroscience, so it, we're take a okay. Yeah, sure. We've got about ten minutes. Jim, okay. Left. 
That's All it. right, so um, when you look at neuroscience, the scholarly field has 24 major branches, 24. Oh my God. And, uh, and that doesn't include all the kind of management books with neuro in front of it, like neuro leadership, neuro coaching, neuro facilitation, neuro this and that. So we then have all this whole field of application. Now, of, of those 24 branches, there seems to me that two or three of them have a lot to do with uh, climate change. And uh, I'd like to just describe them. One of them is affective neuroscience, which is all about the emotions. Uh, and it, it came through um, uh, the researcher named Pank Sepp. That's affective neuroscience. Then there's behavioral neuroscience. Then there's cultural neuroscience. And then we have the one that I believe is absolutely essential and picks up Nancy's earlier comments on the politics. And so we have neuropolitics. And that is a field uh, that looks at the brain and all the issues in political science. And I think that has great potential for us. It's on my list of things to learn about. And uh, when I think of of uh, the Facebook kind of thing and how that uh, makes our dialogue and deliberation thing seem kind of um, naive when we're faced with power that uh, corrupts. And uh, I would like to understand um, what happens to the brains of the folks. Mm -mm. Did Jim freeze? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jim, you just froze. You said what happens to the brains of... Yeah. yeah. What, what, what happens to the political brain? Okay. Yeah. How, do we, how can we understand the political brain? How can we get savvy in this business of the application of power, uh, power opposing, for instance, climate change? How do we how do we understand that? What can we do about it? Jim, are there any books on political neuroscience that you can recommend? Uh, neuropolitics, yes, you can uh, Google neuropolitics, and there are uh, a growing uh, collection of papers on that subject. Great. I just think of uh, um, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yes, and, absolutely. Um, you know, real democracy versus oligarchy. I mean, to me, these these are kind of the timeless principles that determine what happens to our politicians. <laughs> but but that would be great if neuroscience can shed more light. Other thoughts on this, Nancy? Nancy, I really want to understand the um, underlying structures of the brain and theories for whatever it may add but also encourage us for our intuition, experience, and common sense, which may not be so naive. And two images that come up for me, one is the best political mentor I ever knew. There's a story I'll tell another time, but she said, the art of politics is the art of getting other people to do what you want for their reasons. <laughs> and the, the other is uh, one evening in a group of climate concerned folks, we were going through our usual angst about how do you get ordinary folks to care about this, yada, 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 how do you get them in? And this one guy said, you know, if someone invites you into a conversation in order, and you know they're inviting you in because they want to convince you of something they're already convinced of, versus they want to invite you in to together explore struggle with the issues together, try to come up with answers together. Those are two totally different conversations. So a lot of our, our just instinctive sense of how do you, you know, as a, you say, how do you talk to people around the kitchen table, etc. A lot of that is, remains fundamental. We know, we know a lot more than we know. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. 
any other insights based on our fields and what we know about um, interacting with power and ways to modify the political brain that gets haywire? My experience is to find the politicians that are going in the same direction you are and sit down, get to know them, learn what their goals are, and see where you can align. Uh, that's it in a nutshell for me. And, and so you were, yo. So, uh, Sharon, so you're. So I was just going to. Go on. Oh, Sharon, uh, so you're saying that all politics is relational, right? You know what? Life is relational, Jim. That's. Oh, no! Life. Amen! <laughs> That's very secret, right? Number two, it's all about love. But the rest of it is duh. <laughs> so I I would like to comment on comment on that because you know I've I've been with Citizens Climate Lobby for five years and um, there's strains of the ideology of that movement that seem really naive to me and strains that seem very sophisticated to me and um, I I totally agree with what Sharon Joy just said about building relationships with people in power elected politicians, but you also have to have your shit detector out all the time and you have to understand what politics is. It's not just a relational game. The, the game that many politicians are playing is not a relational game. Relationships are a means to another end and they will play the relational game with you and they're really on another level altogether. So it's, there's, a, there's some, some much to be learned and those of us that started late interacting and trying to have influence on our electeds about what, what really works. I don't play with those folks, Marty. I basically don't play with those folks. I do my research ahead of time, and that means experience with those people. And uh, I, I pick my partners very carefully, so I understand exactly what you're saying. Yes. And I personally don't, don't involve myself with what you're describing. Although, let's be honest, a politician is called a politician for those reasons. They're looking to be real. <laughs> However, yeah, I'd like to see they are doing exactly what Nancy said. Yeah. Other, other thoughts on the political brain? Yeah, Barbara. I've spent a lot of time thinking lately about how very much we are right now in a mindset that the only option is win-lose. And you constantly hear a president talk about people being losers or winners. And if that's the way you frame the world, then you will do anything not to be one of the losers. The alternative is to think about how you get to win-win. And the critical piece of getting to a win-win is that you understand that there is interest interdependence, that you both get hurt if you don't win. You both feel good if you do win in a win-win. And that there's a quality of a relationship and that you have to build a lot of trust. Given that, I think more and more about the fact that because the people who go into politics are always about winning and then winning the next election, it keeps moving me more and more into trying to do more of this work in the, in the business frame where Industry is getting it. They're getting the win-win about it. They, I mean, insurance companies understand that they're going to lose their shirts if we don't deal with climate change because of what their payouts look like. And it's much easier to get them to win-win, it seems to me, than it is to work with this really mindset. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay, Nancy, we're just about ready to wrap up, too. Is there a well, very, very quickly both that is a bench that's actually how you get to the politicians through the business influence and mm -hmm. in one of my videos a few shows back the series um foundation which one of the things they're doing is what they're calling the 100 plus project series in this context for that project is 250 
of the uh, five, Fortune 500 companies with a total assets of $24 trillion who have agreed to take on those 100 companies that are still mm -hmm. earning money off fossil fuels and other dirty businesses and getting them to shift. Mm -hmm. Right. So do we have any final substantive comments? I, I want to say a few remarks about the, we've got this recorded, we've got these notes, which will be up here. If there's some resources in the notes, you might want to grab as well, cut and paste to your own document. Um, and Linda, I don't know if there's any other closing housekeeping, um, but I, before we go there, just any, any else, we heard a wonderful presentation from Jim. It's a lot of great concepts that got us, got us going. Is there any um, closing insight that anyone has? Aside from thank, we all want to thank Jim. Share and joy. Yeah. Oh, you're on mute. You're muted. Back again. Sorry. What I'd like us to go deeper into is that question that we raised about, uh, that Jim said, and I flagged it, um, consciousness and changing minds uh -huh. as a topic. And keep on that topic some more in our group. Yes. Great. I see I had not on that. Any other closing comment of how this carries forward or just what you appreciated about today? Um, I'm just struck with how difficult it is to, uh, for me to assimilate the uh, lessons of the, this uh, huge body of work on neuroscience. I'm still struggling with it. I it's think I'll... I mean, I'm intimidated by conversations in which we talk about consciousness and mind and um, still still hoping for uh, a, a way to, to get more of a purchase on it. Thank you. Thank you. And Nancy, you had your hand up? Yeah, Marty, I just wanted to thank you for a superb job of facilitation. Thank you. Yes. Here. And I probably missed it, but uh, I think Jim said, uh, how, how do we access the, the annotated bibliography? <clears throat> um, we just sent it out, right? Yeah, Jim will send it out. Yeah, okay. So Jim, if, actually you sent it to me. So um, I can also post it on the Kiko Chat site and I'll also be posting the Zoom um, recorded, recording on the Kiko Chat site. So you can go under shared resources and you'll find it there. Okay. Great. Is, okay. that in a, is that in addition to sending it out or instead of? Well, do you want sending to send it, it out, Jim, or do you? Um... Sending it out would be great. Please. If you could send it out with a link to the tape, it always helps us that some of us that are technologically challenged <laughs> to get a nice link in our email box that'll shoot us right back in. It really helps. Okay. I know that will work for you, but if you could do that, that would be great. I will take that on. And thank you, Marty, so much for filling in. I thank you. you. You're welcome. Feel better. Feel yeah. better. Yes, indeed. We are on yes. for next month. And Linda, you know the topic for next month. I'm forgetting. Yeah, Grady and Rick are going to be on. Um, we haven't selected a day. I'll put out a doodle poll. Um, I think, Grady, you came up with a few dates, right? But I can't remember. Maybe get with Rick again and send me some dates that you're sure you both are available? I think Rick sent something. Yeah, I don't remember what they are. I'll, I'll remind <laughs> you guys. Anyways, I'll, I'll send something in, in terms of the doodle okay, poll. So let's try to all respond to the doodle poll because we're probably not gonna have a meeting in May. We're probably gonna um, skip May. At least Linda put that out that that might be a possibility, just gearing up and um, for many of us are gonna be going to, um, Cambridge. Yeah. So I don't know whether May's happening or not, but let's all respond to the doodle poll and, and hopefully be on board for a great session in April. Yeah, and I, I think you'll be hearing from uh, Sarah pretty soon about travel arrangements and last details. Looks okay. like. Oh, great. Any final? Did I see a hand? Yes, Barbara. Um, first of all, thank you. My mind is blown by this conversation. It's been wonderful to be part of you. Uh, three things that I've noted that might be useful to the group, and I'm not sure how to post them. 
Um, the link to the, the worker co-op group is the neweconomycoalition.org. Um, the Intentional Endowments Network has put together all kinds of basic information on you know, how do you invest in terms of climate that I can give you the links to. What was it, Barbara? What was it? Repeat it. It was what? The first is the neweconomycoalition.org. Coalition.org. Okay. Yep. And the second is the Intentional Endowments Network.org. Okay. And I'm going to go look for, um, if it's useful to you, I'm pretty sure they made a tape of that conversation with the um, Tea Party woman who talked about how she got conservatives to buy into alternative energy and it was all about language. If I can find that tape yes. linked to it, would that be useful to you? Yes, Great. yes. And it sounds like it would fit right into what Nancy's trying to do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Send it to me, Barbara. I'll send that out with uh, Jim's uh, annotated bibliography in the Zoom. Who is that speaking? I'm sorry, I can't. Linda. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> Linda, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just forward to you. We already have my stuff on the show with the links to the tapes. You could just include that too if you wanted. Sure, yeah, be glad to. So I'll, I'll make a nice little goodie sheet while I am recuperating. <laughs> okay, everyone, we're gonna sign off. Okay, good seeing you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.